All right, so I think we can get started. Um, uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, uh, and we have a great uh, panel uh, put together today. Um, Gerontology Careers Beyond Academia. Um, a panel discussion with um, great speakers from the representing government, nonprofit, and private industry professions. Um, and uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a moment, but just to start, um, this uh, will be an hour session today, and um, we'll just ask everybody if you could please remain muted um, throughout the session. Um, and the session will be recorded uh, for uh, later viewing as well. Um, and then we'll definitely have some time uh, towards the end for audience questions, and we'll be monitoring the chat uh, throughout for those questions as well. So, um, and thanks everybody for coming. So I think we can start with some introductions here. Um, yeah, first myself, um, my name is Kyle Morad. I'm a assistant scientist in the Department of Mental Health at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I'm also um, one of the ESPO junior leaders for health sciences, and that's um, kind of my role on the uh, mentorship subcommittee here. Um, and I'm joined today by I, Tai Dr. Tai Tai Su, uh, postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Toronto. And uh, Dr. Su will introduce our uh, three panelists today. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so to open today's session, I would now like to introduce our three panelists. So first, we welcome Dr. Ali Ahmed, the director of the Center for Health and Aging at the Washington DC VA Medical Center. In addition to this appointment, Dr. Ahmed also served as the clinical director of the Biomedical Informatics Center and professor of medicine at, at the George Washington University. School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Ahmed is a nationally and internationally recognized re expert on chronic health failure in older adults and for using propensity score approach for designing observational studies. His work is funded by the NIH and the VA, and he has been presented and published extensively. Next, we would also like to welcome Dr. Bing Huang, who is a principal scientist at BrainCheck. Dr. Huang received his PhD in computational biology from Rice University. After graduation, Dr. Huang co-founded a technology company named Ferromore and served as the chief technology officer to work on bioinformatics algorithms and product development. Dr. Huang joined the brand check in 2019, and he's leading the clinical development team for clinical studies, product R&D, algorithm development, and research collaborations. His research interest is to explore how technology can improve the diagnosis and care for people living with dementia. We're also delighted to have Dr. Ani Amy Lowe joining us today. Dr. Lowe is an assistant science too at the Marcos Institute for Aging Research within Hebrew Senior Life. Dr. Lowe is also an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Lowe was originally trained and practiced as a physical therapist and she later received a PhD in, uh, in human physiology and completed a T32 postdoctoral fellowship from the Harvard Translational Research in Aging Training Program. Dr. Lowe's career goal is to improve false rehabilitation in older adults by conducting innovative research focused on the neural control and enhancement of gait and mobility. So we are really pleased to have a diverse group of panelists from a range of disciplines to share their experiences, strategies, and insights on how to explore career opportunities outside of a traditional academic setting. So throughout today's session, we encourage questions from the audience. So please feel free to put your questions in chat and I will be monitoring those questions. I'm now giving the mic and screen back to Dr. Kyle Mord, who will lead the panel discussion. Kyle. Great, thanks so much, Tai Tai. Um, and great, yeah, thank you so much um, to all of our speakers too for joining. Um, and I guess just to start, um, you know, if you if we could go around and each of our speakers give a short overview into, you know, what your position is and what daily life is like in your role. Um, and I'll start with just as kind of how I see it on my screen, um, Dr. Ahmed. Hi, um, where do I begin? <laughs> So um, let me begin where I am now. Um, I am at the Washington DC VA Medical Center. That this is a federal facility, as you all probably know. And um, 
I have been here for about 10 years. I have an ad, um, academic appointment at both George Washington University and Georgetown University here. But before I came here, I was, I grew up at UAB in Birmingham. So, um, so I'm a clinician by background. I got my medical degree from my home country, Bangladesh. I, in 1982, so Kyle, should I go into detail, maybe five minute summary capsule of my academic track. Okay, so I graduated in 1982. I came to the US in 1993-94. I began my medical residency and then um, uh, three years medical residency. Then I went, I did that in New York. Then I went to Alabama to do my geriatric fellowship. And I knew at that time that I'm gonna be in the academia. So um, it was a time that geriatric medicine fellowship became one year and I did two years of research fellowship. And around that time, the skills that I learned that I did not learn in medical school, which is to how to write grants and so forth. And, um, and I eventually got, um, I think it was 2000 that I became, I got a faculty appointment. So the two years after my clinical geriatric fellowship, I just was kind of in no man's land, you know, kind of instructor or maybe, you know, a research fellow didn't really have a um, regular faculty appointment. And it can be frustrating because you, you, you feel like that they're not accepting me, you know, and they're leaving me in the no man's land, but it passes. And so I got into acad regular academic faculty appointment. Within a year, I got my K-23. Uh, that was funded for 40 years, protecting 75% of my time to do research. And that's mm -hmm. the time I, I planned to learn about propensity score matching. Um, and I developed a focus in heart failure in older adults. And that has been my focus for the rest of my career. And, um, and in the third year of my K-23, I, I successfully got my first R1 grant. And the, in the third year of my second R1, I got my second R1. That was a smooth uh, transition from K to R1 to the second R1. And in the meantime, you know, I, I started writing, publishing, presenting. And as a part of my uh, service, I probably spent more time with GSA. I, I served on many committees in the GSA. I attended almost every meeting. Uh, I, I, the GSA is the only meeting that I never missed. And I, I probably benefited professionally more from GSA than any other meeting, even though I do mostly cardiovascular work published in the cardiovascular literature, cardiovascular journals, but I have a very close connection to the GSA. And, and then the, what brought me, so in the, when I was at UAB, that is a typical academic institution. Richard Allman was my mentor. He was running this center for aging. And uh, we regularly had aging research, multidisciplinary. Since I moved to the VA, it's more of a federal institution. It's a medical center. Its job is to provide medical service to the veterans. But the VA is a tertiary medical center. So it does work closely with the academia. But again, this is not an academic center. So um, while you have a lot of opportunities in the VA, especially given VA's big data, but you do not have the other um, uh, opportunities that you have in the academia, like you want to talk to your statistical colleagues, it's the next door or in the next building, or you have a you know, very efficient grants office, which is in everything in the federal system is slow. And you have to appreciate that you can't have an academic mood here. But if you have enough patience and you know how to work the system, eventually everything gets done, but not maybe on your timeline. So um, I, I, can, I can answer more specific questions about the opportunities in the VA system about aging research. But one thing I will say that, that VA is a great place to work, but you have to keep in mind that when you compare with the NIH, NIH is more about science 
and the VA is more about veterans' health. So if you can make a case that something is relevant to the veterans' health, and to that extent, it goes to TBI, PTSD, opioid problem, and they can affect older people too. And if you can make a case in that line, you can open a new front, but it still will be, uh, will be competitive. But if you want to do something, uh, you know, I noticed one thing lately that despite the fact that there's a great push for ADRD research, dementia, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and the pay line from the NIA is probably somewhere about 30, 35% when the rest of the NIH pay line is between 10 and 15. Uh, the NVA has a lot of veterans who are getting older, but they, are very interested, but they are not more interested than funding TBI, traumatic brain injury. That's more veteran relevant. Not more interested in than in PTSD because that affects veterans more than the general population. So you have to kind of understand those um, priorities and, and kind of um, change direction to address those priorities or make a case for a priority why dementia is relevant to the veterans. And if you can make a case, you'll still gonna get funded. So it's not totally restricted to VA-centric topics, but you have to make your case, like anything else. Now, I'll stop there with. Great, thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Um, that was a great overview, especially how VA um, kind of their goals as well and how they may differ from um, NIH and some of these other government positions as well. Um, thank you so much. And I'll go over to Dr. Uh, Amy Lowe uh, next. Um, if you could, yeah, just provide a short overview, maybe if you wanted to touch on how you got to your current position too, um, that'd be wonderful. Sure. Um, so uh, I guess I was talk about career path and then where I landed to where I am right now. So I was first trained as a physical therapist and I practiced uh, as a physical therapist first and I got the degree in a uh, PhD. And after that, I came to current one, the Marcus Institute for Aging Research. And since uh, my T32, I just continue to uh, stay as a faculty here. So I think uh, Hebrews in Your Life is um, uh, a center that's taking care of all type of older adults. We have about uh, 1,000, um, housing units in independent housing, assistant housing, as well as taking care of older adults from uh, outpatient, inpatient, in-home care, like all the spectrum. So within the Hebrew scenario, we, there's a special, uh, in special uh, department, Marcus Institute for Aging Research. So we basically conduct all type of um, aging study. And uh, academia-wise, we affiliate with Harvard Medical School. So most of the uh, scientists staff here, they also have an academic position. Uh, but most of the work that we do is research. <laughs> so, uh, and then um, we basically, writing grants and paper is the biggest portion of our life. So um, we have to, because that's also, we will talk about later if we have time, is a soft money position. So almost 100% rely on grants. So a lot of time when you advance, one R01 is not sufficient. So you need multiple R01 or from other different type of foundation or type of resource sources to uh, continue with this track. Um, so mostly research, but we definitely, as we said, we have a email appointment. So we do have some teaching, oppor teaching opportunity and teaching responsibilities, but it's much less like uh, um, sometimes I'm currently having the KO1, so 75% at least for the research and maybe 25% or lower for the teaching um, responsibility. But yeah, I'll stop here. Great, Thank, thanks, Amy. Um, and then uh, last, we'll go to Dr. Uh, Huang, uh, Ben Huang. Um, and it, I'll just say real quick too, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but um, audience, if, if you wanted to, anytime you have a question, you're welcome to put it in the chat too, and we'll uh, monitor the chat. Um, but yeah, Dr. Wong. Yeah, thank you. Um, very glad to be here. And uh, so I'm coming from like, a, you know, private industry. So um, so I think as introduction, I'm currently working at BrainCheck as a principal scientist. So I was gather my PhD like in computational biology, like from Rice in the 2017. 
So uh, very theoretical work, if you know about that. So, and uh, then I was, uh, there's kind of like a student kind of organized kind of um, accelerator happens when I was the last year in my PhD. So that got me into the accelerator and then meet my co-founder. Then, you know, we try out our ideas and we raise the money and then, okay, then we say like, right now we try it. So we, so we start a company like uh, with the state funding and for two years. Um, so uh, I was mostly in charge of technology and the product development. That's kind of like new to me, but also have some like uh, computer biology kind of give me some kind of data kind of like skills like uh, for that roles. Uh, so I learned a lot about technology stuff and also learned a lot from the business part. And uh, so when I wrap up the company, I think in 2000, around 19, um, so I did kind of consider whether I should go back to do my postdoc or I should continue like with the other kind of industry job. So, um, but for sure, I was very into the technology. And then also like, I do want to do more things like uh, that is more, not like very theoretical work. I want to make some more difference, like uh, which can be have bring more like impact, like to the, you know, to the people. So then like the opportunity shows up like uh, with BrainCheck. So uh, maybe a little background about BrainCheck is like uh, we do the computerized cognitive assessment and also cognitive care planning. So we design the tools for the product for the provider to use in their daily uh, practice. So mainly right now sell to the you know, primary care provider so they can use the tool to screen the dementia and uh, you know, neurodegeneration disease. And uh, then they can also prepare the care plan for the patients and their caregivers. Um, so it's kind of a combination about technology and also like uh, you know cognitive stuff. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. So I joined the company initially as kind of more like a, you know research scientist and a data scientist. So I do a lot of coding at the beginning uh, because of my background. And but now I'm transitioning more to a manager roles like for research. So I I lead the clinical development team in the company, and so we work on project for research data and the product. So there will be a lot of time meetings and the coordination and the planning right now happens. So half of my daily life, I think, will be on the research and the data. So it will be very similar to like uh, Dr. Law and Dr. You know, Ahmad, what you mentioned. So like uh, we do a lot of kind of grant writing, like, uh, you know, also like uh, writing the protocol, like summit for IRB, checking the status of the st study, you know, solving the problem, discussing the result. It's very research. But also another half of my work will be, you know, focus on the business and the product. So we have a lot of interaction with the other department and uh, in our company. So because, for example, as a medical device company, so when we push out the new feature or new tools, we need to validate it first. So there will be a lot of interaction with the engineers and uh, so and also with marketing teams. And also sometimes we will be pulling like a total just sales meeting, you know, to be the people there to answer any kind of scientific questions. Um, so that's kind of like a you know half research, probably half business. So. Great, thank you, Dr. Huang. And it's interesting to hear sort of grant writing is universal, appears to be universal in the, all of your professions. Uh, great, yeah, thank you so much. Um, kind of as a follow-up to sort of what um, the oh, nice overviews you just provided. Um, and I know some of your positions are sort of more connected with academia than others, but um, you know, could you share any sort of key factors that sort of shaped your decision to sort of end up in your current non-university affiliated role. Um, uh, and that these factors can be sort of interpreted broadly, like life factors or, you know, career focus factors. Um, and I guess, yeah, again, we'll start with Dr. Ahmed. Well, you know, my um, academic career um, is um, primarily based on um, data research. So, um, my K23, my 201 grants, they were um, based on big data. And when I said big data, you know, I had my first grant on 10,000 people. The next one was 50,000 people, but, um, but nothing like what I do now. So VA has one of the largest databases. So for example, we're working on a, a funded project on heart failure. So we have about one and a half million heart failure patients. That's um, twice, bigger than the AHA get with the guideline heart failure population. So um, the, um, 
but I don't have the skills to work on such a big data set. I can handle 10, 50,000, 100,000 patients. But when you go into a big database like the one VA has, you really need to work with data scientists and people who really know how to navigate the data. So I work with a very good group of people here. Um, almost all of them are PhDs. And the kind of work I do is very, um, unlike most MDAs would do, with you know, dealing with data and I'm almost exclusively I do research now. I mean, I do have clinical appointments, but I, I mean, most clinicians can do um, go to a clinic and see patients, but most can't do what I do here. And so um, I have this, this unique um, position here that may not be uh, much generalizable to a lot of people, but if you if you have the passion that I had, that I wanted to, you know, deal with data and um, ask questions and get answers and uh, and um, you know add to the body of knowledge, and uh, you, you can do that. So the VA is a great place if you want to um, to uh, answer questions. What is sitting in the data? It's almost like um, you know. I, there's someone who wants to tell you a story and you don't speak the language. So you have, and you're so eager to know that story, you have to learn the language and then you get to hear the stories. So the VA data is like that. It's holding a lot of information. If you learn how to speak to it, you know, then you can get a lot of information out of it. So that's, that, that's the primary uh, driver of my wanting to work with the VA because of the VA data. And again, you know, the VA has, uh, it's not an academic institution. It has its limitations. Everything can be slow, but will eventually be done if you have patience and if you know how to build bridges and make friendships and network with people and things eventually get done, but um, can be slow and frustrating. <laughs> so what, one of the way we get things done, we have partnership with GW. So we have a shop there. So most of the time you get a grant funded and we can't hire someone in the VA because it takes six, nine, 12 months, sometimes a couple of years. By that time your grant will be gone. So we have, uh, we have people on the university side and we do IPAs and they come and work on, uh, on our project here. So you have to kind of be uh, innovative and develop devices and tools to get things done. Great, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And then Dr. Lowe. Um, so some key factors that shape my career path, I think two. Uh, one is I, I actually have been open myself to like industry, academia, wherever, when I was in postdoc and PhD. But um, I think one is I am fortunate enough to get the grant. So one, so that's why I, I always tell that if I don't get a grant, I like find some other job because it's soft money position. But uh, I don't know why, just get the grant. So that's why let me stay. And then another factor is a family factor to, uh, I sort of have to stay Boston area because my husband is here. It's, his job is probably uh, less likely for him to move to other places. Otherwise I will also open to nationally other states or even international position when I was like the younger, not like younger, <laughs> uh, a few years ago. But the, that's the two factors that I shape where I am right now. Thanks, and, and Dr. Wong. Yeah, um, I think I already kind of touched it in my previous kind of overview. Uh, one is kind of like, uh, I've been very kind of interested in the technology and also because of startup experience. So uh, after that, I really want to work on something more like uh, have direct impact and can make some really difference. And uh, instead of going back to work on some very theoretical mathematical models. So that's why I want to do some research for the health related kind of tech. And, uh, you know, definitely there's a lot of, kind of research also going on in the academy, but wouldn't it be better just like working with industry and actually see the patients using it? So then when brain check shows up, I was like, okay, that's great. Um, also, uh, especially in the field I'm working on before, so getting a job, I think faculty job after postdoc is actually very hard. And, uh, you know, also considering, you know, the job opportunities, availabilities, um, I think like, a, you, you know, that's why I kind of say there's an option already, like uh, you can just take the job, then I just take it, so, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Dr. Wong. Um, so for next question, um, uh, and some of you already touched on this again, but sort of what are the specific benefits or any also drawbacks of working in your current role? Um, I think Dr. Ahmed, you kind of covered this pretty well already. So I might just jump to Dr. Lowe, um, if you don't mind, but um, yeah, Dr. Lowe. Sure, uh, I think there, I thought about a few benefits, like maybe one, two, I put three. So one is um, really the interest. If you, if I like to like, if you like to have some, uh, well, first of all, it's work with some established researchers because I think in this environment, I have a lot of rich resources and I was fortunate to um, mentored by several uh, pioneer or established uh, professor in the field. So uh, this environment really can um, shape a lot of um, direction of my career path. And second is really conduct uh, translational uh, research because with my backgrounds, I have some clinician, clinician background and scientist background. I really want to in the environment conduct the translational research which for example, Hebrew Sinai has so many older adults. Of course, we don't just study adults here. We study all the older adults, but just within the environments, we get to really touch base in the daily basis with older adults and different level of the older adults. I think that environment is really good for the translational work and, and then easy to implement science. I can like easily work with the uh, different health specialties, PTOT and now like music therapists, like very translational. And then uh, third is really research. I mean, that good thing is I have majority time to do research, can protect my time. I mean, I love teaching too, but if I'm the more like teaching oriented uh, environment, it will be, uh, I'll be less time um, doing research. So I think that's the main benefit that I um, think this environment provide. And the drawbacks, definitely the soft money and stress. <laughs> As you said, like sometimes um, we don't have students providing us, uh, uh, providing the um, resources, and then we really have to rely on grant. And then, as you know, like grants are not really always easy to get. Um, so that can be stressful. Dr. Lo and Dr. Wong, how about any benefits or drawbacks to your? Yeah, so working in my kind of role, I think like uh, one thing as mentioned before, the impact basically kind of the, you know, kind of satisfaction maybe like uh, of your work. Uh, so all me and all my team member, I think we believe we are working on something really important. And also, uh, you know, there's responsibility for us, like uh, because it will be used by the provider on the patients like every day. Um, also, I think it helped me to open, uh, maybe like a look at the things from a different angle. Um, I know there's a lot of great research out there, but you know, like uh, some of them can be hard to implement in the real world. So I think for us, like we are seeing like people and get the feedback from people and uh, about the real world implementation, I think, uh, you know, give us a different kind of way to think about the problem sometimes. And uh, and also I'm working in a startup company. So, you know, startup company, like uh, it's a very exciting, you have to wear multiple hats. And uh, so, and also digital health is pretty new. So we are able to work on many different projects and uh, work with a lot of different people. And, uh, you know, so it's uh, basically like uh, you get you know, ability like to learn a lot of stuff. And uh, and to be honest, like a financial level, I think like uh, financially it's also kind of, you know, industry I can, I think pay a little bit better than the academy. Uh, so definitely it's another kind of benefit. Uh, I think for job acts, uh, because I'm working for private industry. So one will be like, uh, what kind of project you can pick up to work on. So it has to be aligned with business, with aligned with the vision about the company. So it's not like you have a lot of freedom to pick up whatever you want to work on. And uh, you know things will be moving really fast and changing very fast in the startup, especially. And uh, you know you maybe like uh, you're working on this project, but maybe like the vision or the long-term plan of the company have been changed, and uh, you have to switch. Um, and uh, probably also job security. You know, I think we had a lot about like a layoff recently from the big tech company. So I think like, uh, I think industry may be a little bit less secure than the um, academy. Uh, there's a lot of things can impact it. Uh, I think the last one is kind of a little bit funny. So uh, I think maybe you, a lot of people assume like we found ourselves like for our study, but actually we also apply for grants. So, but there's uh, like a much less kind of opportunity for the for-profit company. So I think there are only a few options we can apply for. And, uh, you know, that's kind of will be a later become a job X. 
Thanks, Dr. Wong. Um, great. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my next question, I'm kind of going to go off of one of, the, we're getting some great audience questions. So I might actually go to one of those and kind of ask. Um, so one, one audience member asked, um, sort of for those of you who are in more research focused PhDs and programs, did you seek an internship while you were in graduate school before you got to your current position? And then kind of as an extension of that, sort of for each of your roles and your organizations you work for, sort of what does, do they hire, um, what, what do sort of entry level positions look like, you know, at the VA or at Brain Check? Um, what kind of people, what kind of experience do you typically hire? So sense. in the in the academia, you know, as an MD, I went I went through two years of research training fellowship with a fellow salary when I could have gotten a job as a clinician because I needed this experience, that experience to be ready to become an independent investigator. So one has to be prepared to spend a couple of years, and that could be, um, you know, the um, most important time. I, I once went to a conference and one guy was talking about an orthopedic surgeon that he went to um, the residency, um, then orthopedic surgery fellowship. And then he, he said that he spent the last year doing hand surgery. And he said, that's the only thing he does now. So sometimes the things that you learn in the last year or two of your training, collective training will be that you will be doing for the rest of your life. So it's very important and it's, it's not a good idea to you know, uh, try to um, minimize it or compact it, you know, take your time and th this probably would be the best investment that it would make. Um, so that would be good. At the v on the VA side, you know, because it is not an academic institution, so you don't have that type of entry level opportunities here. If you have an entry level opportunity, it's gonna be, clinically relevant opportunities. So whether you come from physical therapy or, or sociology that has aging relevance, because remember veterans are, most of veterans are older adults. So you do have a lot of opportunities here. And one of the other point I want to make that even if you are on soft money in an academia, that the, the skills you learn, we're gonna have applications in the places like the VA, or even in the industry. So I think, you know, one of the things I used to tell my um, trainees and so, something that I practice that, you know, you can't think harder than someone who is smarter than you. I think it's almost like it's limited by your gift, but I say, think hard and work harder. And if you follow that principle, you know, you, you should be successful because all of you made to this point, you know, people here and people listening, so uh, all you have to do is just keep working hard and uh, make the th think hard and work harder. That's the ground rule. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Um, and Dr. Lowe, how about, how about you? Uh, kind of what's your perspective on um, internships during PhD program and, and also sort of for Hebrew senior life, kind of what uh, do the entry level positions look like? There? Well, um... Hebrew, well, Hebrew Senior I have different, but Marcus Institute, we don't really have a lot of entry position. We, I mean, entry position will be a research assistant. Most of our research assistant are uh, college graduates. They are full-time position. Well, sometimes we have a summer intern. They are intern, um, but they usually are hoping to get an MD after this training and after this position and, or health PhD or, um, yeah. And then that's the research part, but the, um, I don't know about a PhD student get the maybe some more like um, at least for what I did we don't have that much intern opportunity PhD itself is a lot of, a lot of work <laughs> so we don't really see for an internship during the PhD uh, period but uh, I can see some uh, technology base would be great to have some relationship with the industry and then can easier transition immediately after the PhD program. That's a good transition to asking Dr. Wong, what is your perspective yeah. on internships and kind of what entry level positions does your company? Have? Yeah, um, so I think for BrainCheck, because we are a kind of startup company, we don't have a lot of entry level. It's kind of because we want to hire someone ready to go. And so 
um, maybe it's still entry level, but just like uh, we want to hire some people who are more like, uh, uh, for my experience, will be like uh, uh, able to work like independently and uh, they are, you know, like uh, they are very kind of have the ability to learn new stuff because a lot of time, like uh, um, it's hard to find like uh, what you're working on your PhD, like uh, directly matching with industry. So when you're getting into the trade, you probably have to learn something new, especially for startup companies. So I think if I'm, when I hire for someone, I, that would be the most kind of important kind of thing I'm looking at. So are you able to work alone yourself and are you able to pick up the things yourself uh, and learn something pretty quick? Um, in terms of internship, um, so to be honest, like uh, if I'm still in the PhD, I probably get an internship and uh, at least for kind of, uh, for BrainChat, this kind of technology-based kind of company, um, I think um, it also kind of open your option uh, opportunities, like not only for this type of industry, but the potential you also can go for the others. I do believe PhD is trained is trained like to solve problem. I think like uh, that kind of problem solving skill is uh, critical. Um, so like uh, if you ask me, I would say like uh, you know get an internship or get a some idea about the industry. At least know like whether you like it or not like it. I know some people, they are not totally into like industry. Uh, I think better to get the idea at the beginning, like, uh, you know, instead of try it like later, so. Great, thank you. And it's nice to hear too that sort of looking for independence, there are skills that we you naturally learn in the PhD program that yeah. can kind of transfer to that. Um, great, yeah, and I think um, sort of going off of another audience question and one of our questions for you too is, um, kind of on the idea of work-life balance um, and sort of, you know, do you find it easy or difficult in your particular positions to maintain a work-life balance and, uh, you know, what strategies do you use to do this? And, you know, this kind of goes along with one audience question, which was, you know, if you're not in need of a grant, if you're not in sort of the grant panic mode, um, uh, do you find yourself working typically a 40-hour work week or, you know, does it look different than that? Oh, and I'll go to uh, probably Dr. Ahmed. Well, um, you can't really have a 40 hour, hour work week and, um, and be in the academia. I mean, you can do a job. Like if you do, um, if you work in the VA uh, and you have a 40 hour work week, they can actually make you work more than that. It's a federal institution. So you have to leave literally. And, uh, uh, but, in, but in the academia, all of you know, you can't have a 40 hour work week, you know, you can't get anything done. Most of the time I got my things done over, you know, weeknights and weekdays, weekends and so forth. So, um, you no, know, and especially if you have a clinical responsibility, like a clinical psychologist or something, uh, you don't have a protected time. You just have to use your own time. So it, it becomes challenging. So having said that, you also have to find the balance to, to get the work done and also give, take care of yourself and uh, your loved ones, you know? So uh, it, it's, it's individual and you all have to find your way to strike the balance. Great, and how about you, Dr. Lowe? Um, I don't know. I typically view it as a work-life integration. I don't think there's ever a balance <laughs> for me. Um, not only like scientists, I'm also a mom of uh, younger kids. Uh, I think that definitely changed a lot of <laughs> my life um, uh, dynamics. Before kids, if, if I can use a lot of weekends, weekday night time, like to get work done. Now it's like almost impossible. So I think my strategy, um, I mean, I have three thoughts. That's one is really actually have to make sure I set up time for self-care, <laughs> make sure I'm like healthy and then okay for me to manage so many things. Um, so I definitely like set up time in my calendar, just like all oh, the meeting calendar, I set up time for exercise. So <laughs> I'm like, this is my time for exercise. I, my husband take care of the kid, I just leave the house and then <laughs> come back in an hour. And same thing for him, like he can go. We have some like self-care time. And then also um, plan ahead whenever there's a and help look for help and resources. So for example, if there's a crazy grand season coming in, then I will okay, 
following next month, um, I will need additional time. So I'm, I definitely have to find a sitter to help me to watch him a certain time so I can buy some time for <laughs> grants, uh, writing the grant or some other more time sensitive type of job task. And three is lower my standards, sadly. <laughs> and I know that's just uh, more realistic because it's just impossible for me to, I'm also tend to be a little bit ambitious and perfectionist. So I really have to like, it's okay to, for example, it's fine to be messy, not as neat as I want, or it's fine to maybe have one less paper in this year to sort of like, because I don't want to miss my kids grow during this precious time. So things like that, just okay with it. And this is a, a lot of lesson to learn <laughs> throughout the years and still, still learning. Great, thank you. I like a lot of those points. Um, and Dr. Wong, how about you? Um, so, okay, so first I need to say it's depend on companies. And so from, from my company, um, you know, like from my experience, we have great work-life balance. So we remote first, uh, I work four days at home and the nine to five unlimited PTO. So um, I really like the, you know, the culture. I think it's more dependent on company culture. So we respect everyone's time. So if it's your off business or your time off, we try our best not to bother the other people. Um, but, you know, like, uh, um, so back to the one question, I think um, whether you can still work in 40 hours, like without the grant, um, we we can. And uh, because like uh, grant has been an important kind of funding resource, but not like uh, only one. So we also like self fund like uh, uh, like researches, you know, as long as like uh, we have, you know, right kind of stuff, like uh, we still can do a lot of research ourselves. Um, and also, as mentioned, there's also business requirement and, uh, you know, like a uh, product requirement we have to participate. So it's just kind of half of work, maybe the focus on research, but another half will be also focused on the business and the product. Um, and uh, I think if there's any suggestion from my experience, like uh, we just have to learn how to say no to others, as in, at least in the industry. So because then be, there could be a lot of kind of like a request from the different department, but we just need to, you know, make sure we are not like, uh, you know, overburn ourselves, like uh, we have the priority list. So we will say no, like, uh, you know, you, you know, politely, but like uh, decline some of the requirements. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, saying no is something I'm trying to work on too. <laughs> so that's a good skill to have. Um, so great. Yeah, maybe I think now I'll sort of turn it over to Taite because we have some additional um, audience questions. Taite, did you want to um, ask those to the panel? Yes, sure. So we have several questions coming from chat. So the first question is, um, let me scroll up. Oops. Okay, I will ask the last question first. So uh, a participant asked, are there specific skills that you wish you would have developed more during your schooling to help you with your current position? Well, you, you have to continue to learn because something you learn in the school will, might be old by the time you get into your academic life or, you know, or your, you know, seeking jobs. Um, so you have to continue to evolve and learn because the world around you is changing. You can't just stick to one thing. Uh, there are some fundamentals that will stay there, but then the things that will give you the age and make you competitive will change and you have to adjust with that. There's no other way. So you have to continue to learn, continue to evolve. Yeah, I can echo like, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Aman, like, uh, you know, keep learning. And uh, as I mentioned before, like ability to learn new stuff and uh, able to, you know, work along is, I think it's important. And also communication skills, like, you know, uh, industry, you're in the industry you're talking with, like you have to communicate with your team members, especially if you're a small team. So there's more close relationship. And uh, so I think like, uh, you know, developing your communication skills and uh, in your PhD, I think will be important. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. If I may add one other point, you know, when I was at UAB and I had two R1 grants, uh, I was a PI and I literally wrote it myself. And um, 
even except probably for the statistical part. But then when I came here, I teamed up with um, a great colleague, Ching Zhang. She's a PhD and she's an AI person. And together with her and other people, we have been more successful. So at some point you have to network with other people that have complementary skills. You know, I can learn AI what she does. And she, she doesn't have the clinical background, but she works with a lot of clinical people helping them. Like a statistician would help any any scientific um, branches, medical branches. The other thing I found out is that I, uh, even though I spent all my life working on geriatric heart failure since I came to the VA, I found out that the VA is very interested in answering questions that are important to the veterans. So I, uh, I have a grant on TBI, traumatic brain injury. We have a grant on, um, on opioid disorder. So things like that. So you have to kind of be able to diversify to be able to... So I still, my passion is in heart failure. I still write in that field. I have grants in that field, but you know I have uh, more grants on non-heart failure topics. And uh, that is, that may or may not be always possible, but you have to remain open to that because you know it's very competitive and you have to remain competitive. It can be an ideal is that, oh, this is not heart failure, I'm not interested, then you will be, losing your age in, in the academia, in that sense. Thanks for that, those points. Um, and I, it kind of made me think too, uh, it sounds like not only communication, good communication is a good skill in terms of like being able to write clearly and things like that, but also being able to communicate with people and sort of with different roles or different perspectives um, sounds to be key as well. Um, so yeah, and Dr. Lowe, did you want to say anything too? I, just um, I think I agree all of the above. And I'll add one more is storytelling story skill. It's actually related to grant writing and communication. I think that's something that is also really fundamental. You want to have your grant stand out, you need to have a good idea and then have a good way to deliver this idea. That's a very important point. You have to connect to your viewers, your readers. I remember when I wrote, um, so I learned about propensity score matching with the K-23 grant, which is a four-year grant from NIA. And then I applied that in, a, in my first R01 grant. And I remember the, so I, I gave a lot of thought and I said, you know, I have to explain to these people what it is. And uh, the reviewer once said that this is the first time I understood what propensity score is. You know, so you have to be at the level to win them over. And uh, you can't just, you know, because you understand and you have, you can expect that they will too, you have to connect to them. And that's where the storytelling comes. You, you know, the, everyone can look at the same piece of data and come up with the different stories. We just recently wrote a paper and we, um, it's almost like we had a half, you know, glass half full, half empty. So initially we thought we we're gonna focus on half empty and then, um, and, and make the point that it's too hard to do that. But on the other hand, we, after much discussion with a lot of colleagues and experts, we decided, no, we can flip it and make it a case for half full. And we should try to be like that, you know? So you can make, you can make a case for both sides that it is too hard to do. And we can do that with, with less intensive approaches. And that's reasonable. On the other hand, you can make the case that, well, you, you know, you, you can try to do better and better get better better results, you know. So it all depends on how you want to frame it and sell it. The data remains the same. Thank you so much, Doctors uh, Ahmed, Dr. Huang, and Dr. Lo, for sharing your uh, insights and perspectives on this on this question. And we also have another question uh, coming from the audience. So, how important do you think? networking is in your uh, current company or um, in, in a company or industry or in your current position? Uh, I can answer first. So um, quite important. So, <laughs> and uh, because uh, we cannot assume like our priority is the other people's priority. So, you know, maybe for on my side, like it's great to have this feature and uh, important to have this kind of data collected, but 
kind of like I uh, mentioned before the communication, right? So you have to deliver the message and uh, to the exact team and also to the product team to prioritize them. But same time, like uh, remember, they also re receive like millions kind of like uh, the other requests from the sales team, marketing team, and also our customers. So then like, uh, you know, you have to networking with them and, uh, you know, also explain the, you know, the urgency and also the why it's important. So um, also make some friends, you know, uh, so I think that's quite important. I think for, uh, I'm just talking from like, uh, how to moving forward your job and your projects. I think from that kind of aspect, I think networking is definitely also very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Huang. And Dr. Lo and or Dr. Ahmad, do you have any thoughts on networking? Um, yeah, I also agree like networking. I think I got this job because I met someone in the conference. That's how I know about these places and these opportunities. So definitely, I think uh, it applies for uh, any area and I help you to improve your communication skill. Very important. Um, and um, you know, as a junior faculty, I never hesitated approaching people to to get to know them, get to work with them. And um, the the worst thing they can say, no, we're too busy, you know. But but uh, with that approach, I met with a lot of people that I have worked for the last 15, 20 years together. And uh, it's only because I I asked them. <laughs> So, and, you know, and of course you can't just randomly ask, you have to know their work and, and, and show that you can intellectually process it. You have a question that intellectually stimulates them, perhaps they even missed it. So you have to impress them, you know, they're busy people, but it's very important. I, 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 I think I have benefited enormously from, uh, from, um, networking and, and, and it has to come from you, you know, you have to approach them. And um, and uh, most of the time, people will be, especially in the geriatric field, people would be willing to help you. Very nice people, both geriatrics and aging field. Thank you so much. And we have uh, one question. Um, I think this is the the first question. So, when you found yourself interested in industry, did you have your full CV as well as a more traditional one-page resume? at the ready yeah um i can answer first like a uh, one pager so uh no we are not going to look at the full cv and especially if you know i think last time we hired someone we have around like 200 300 people apply for that position so it will be no way far to review all the series so i think one pager and uh highlight your most important part i think like you know a check like uh, the reviewer i think that would be most important Excellent. Uh, Dr. Ahmed or Dr. Lo, do you have any other thoughts on how to prepare your CV or resume? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that can, but because we are not in that industry, so our CV structure is different, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I think most major academic institutions, they have their own format. Um, so if, if, if you are in an academic institution, you probably want to follow your institution's format. It, it will be necessary if you want to apply for a promotion, tenure, it's a requirement. You can't get around that. Um, um, no, that is pretty much it. Um, and of course, you have to learn how to do your biosketch, NIH biosketch. Um, you will need that when you apply for a grant. Thank you question about undergrad yeah. um yeah i guess yeah, so, it depends yeah. on your level right postdoc if it's relevant to the postdoc maybe you can mention it but if you are far a little bit further away or the 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 feel is not relevant then i don't feel like you need to but it's relevant i think you can mention if it's in the early stage of your uh, job searching and also if it fit into one page and uh, you can include that but i i think the most latest one will be definitely better um, you know, I think uh, also you can just bring it up if you get the interview opportunity, you always bring it up, but I think, you know, you have to put the most important thing, I think, on the one page, like to, to make sure you get the, you know, interviews. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I think we have uh, a couple more minutes, so please feel free to put your questions in chat, or you can also unmute yourself and ask questions. 
say too, if um, if we don't get any additional questions, maybe um, if we go around uh, for each speaker to, um, you know, uh, if you had any final advice for people, um, sort of, especially those who are in the stage of looking for a, a job or a career. Um, yeah, do you have any sort of parting advice for everyone? And I guess we'll start with Dr. Ahmed. Well, you know, I always say that never ask, you know, what you want, always, you know, ask what your potential employer might be needing. And if you make yourself indispensable, you if that's your best job security. Um, you know, if you go around and tell that I badly need a job or need a raise, um, in my experience, it never works that way. You have to, you have to uh, ask, what can I do for you? Or I have these skills and I know this is what you do and I can do it better. So you have to sell yourself as what you can do for them, not what you want for yourself. And once you do make that connection um, and, and they appreciate, I mean, we had had people that we didn't want to lose, you know? So if you can make yourself like that, they would want to lose you. So that's your best job security. Um, I think in this stage, if I would tell myself, I would tell myself like be kind and be patient uh, to yourself and to others. <laughs> <laughs> because I think there's so many um, unpredicted, uh, unpredictable and uncontrolled factors along the job searching career path, this type of, um, journey. So yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, I think uh, for my side, so uh, I think if you look at the AI related research right now, I think there's some change about the, I think, paradigms, like, you know, how and where the research can happen and can be done compared to decades ago. So I think uh, in the field about this gerontology or aging, I think it also happens right now, there's more kind of digital health kind of companies or you know, some of the other kind of type of startups and shows up. So I think you probably should just be, you know, open for all these kind of opportunities. Um, maybe, you know, apply for internship and or maybe have some collaborations for study with the industry. You know, like I think that will be, as I mentioned before, you know, at least get some um, ideas how the how the work has been done over there and whether you'll be like it or not. Um, also, it's a you know, it would be good for you, like, uh, if you want to look in for some industry job, have some industry experience. Um, I mean, like, if you are interested in the, in the industry kind of internship, you can always reach out to me. We may have some opening, I think, like, uh, sometimes. And also, uh, you know, we have a grant, we have a program on the website can support some pilot studies, and you can also fund it. You can work with us for some, like, uh, collaboration on the studies. It's basically just braincheck.com slash grant. Um, yeah, so... And also, if you have a question, just reach out. So, thank you so much. And yeah, there was actually a kind of a speaking of contacting um, uh, if, uh, question in the audience if the speakers wouldn't mind sharing either their email or their uh, LinkedIn contact information too. Uh, if you could post that in the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I think we're right at almost two o'clock here. So um, I just wanted to finish up by thanking uh, so much our speakers uh, for joining us today. Um, and, and also thanking Taite uh, for leading, uh, co-leading this um, uh, uh, webinar as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks everybody in the audience as well thank for joining you. today. Um, yeah, uh, have a good weekend and uh, I think we're good to go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.